Um, <clears throat> so today we'll do particle systems, um, story system, and UI. So a lot of things, but they're all not, not that big. So hopefully we'll uh, finish in time. So particle system uh, is what we use for particle simulation. Um, and particle is like a, like a common term in, in game engines, as I'm sure you know. But if you start to think about it, you could, could sort of uh, ask yourself, what, what is really a particle? What do we mean by a particle? What makes, what makes something a particle? Uh, what makes a particle distinct from the other things that we simulate in the game and then like uh, bodies or, or meshes or whatever? Well, generally what we, what we mean by uh, by particles is some kind of collection of a lot of small things, a large number of smallish things that are uh, all controlled by a single set of rules. So we have a single set of rules specifying how all these uh, small things could use. So that's kind of a big definition. It could include things like flocks of birds and stuff like that too. Uh, or footsteps, maybe, like footsteps sinking down in sand could also be considered particles in the sense that they're all, we have a lot of them and they're small things and they all follow the same rules, they all fade out at the same time and so on. So that's that's our the definition that I'm going to use of particles. Uh, and it's kind of uh, the reason for having a particle system is that when we have lots of things that do the same thing, we can sort of there are more efficient ways of handling that than, than with, for example, characters where you have, they're typically not doing the same thing, they're all running in different directions and they had each need to be processed individually, but uh, these large collections of things doing the same thing can sort of be processed en masse. So that's why it makes sense to have separate, more efficient system for them that allows us to simulate a, a large number of them. Um, so currently, our particle system kind of uses a fixed set of controllers, uh, controllers that tell these particles how to behave. Uh, but we also have a vision that we've had for quite some long time, but we haven't really started on yet, of a more flexible particle system that we could implement in the future. So I'll describe what we have now uh, to begin with and then uh, give some thoughts about what we're thinking for the future. So, uh, in Stingray, a particle effect consists of multiple sub-effects or, or what we call clouds. And a cloud is a, a collection of particles that behave the same way. So in, in an effect, which is the thing you play from, from Lua, for example, uh, you might have mul multiple of those clouds. For example, if, 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 if you have a particle effect that represents fireworks, you could have one set of red dots that expand in one way and one set of yellow dots that expand in another way and then they would be two different clouds following different rules but they would be part of the same overall effect um, so that's why we we sort of have the concept of effects and then the concept of cloud which are individually collections of particles in an effect so uh, we represent the cloud by a number of channels and the channels are, are just data streams and they can be either float channels or vector three channels they either hold a single number or a vector of three numbers and these channels are pre-sized uh, so that they have room for the maximum numbers of particles that we can have in a cloud of of this type so so clouds always have sort of a fixed maximum size which is the total number of particles that can ever live in the cloud so we that's yes yeah, so we don't have to do to do any sort of dynamic resizing of, of the cloud and allocate memory we pre-allocate that uh, all of that memory up ahead um, so typical channels in in a cloud can be things like position the position of the particle um, the lifetime how long this particular particle has lived and that might affect like color, it might fade out after a certain time and so on. Velocity, uh, the direction it's moving and the speed. Uh, position and velocity are, are vector three. Oh, oh, I forgot to, oh, sorry, I forgot to scare, 
share my screen. I thought I was, I, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Sorry, that makes it a lot harder to follow the talk. <laughs> All right, should be set up now. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so, where was I? Yeah, multiple different kinds of channels, position, velocity, lifetime, mass, for example, used if, if you want some physics simulation of the particles and so on. Um, so, in, in old school particle systems, uh, you typically have a particle is always a fixed struct with a fixed set of channels, but that tends to be kind of unflexible. You, you have like only a fixed number of things that a particle can be. So we have a more flexible data-driven system where the set of channels is not fixed. It's defined in the particle resource that we're going to look at later. And it could be anything. You could add whatever channels you need here. So if you want particles that, that have different kind of sugar content and behave differently based on that, you could have like a sweetness channel or cuteness channel, whatever whatever you want. You can just add, add whatever channels you want. And these channels also don't have any, any predefined meaning. I mean, we talk about the position channel uh, because we know it represents a position, but by itself it doesn't really represent anything, it's just data. And it only gets its meaning by it interacts with the different controllers and renderers that are attached to, to this cloud, the different... So, so there's a controller that is used to update the position, uh, so the a controller that takes it to velocity, multiplies it by delta time and adds that to the position. And because that's the behavior we accept, we expect from positions, that controller, together with the renderer that renders the particle at that position, gives the meaning to the position channel. Uh, but the position channel might as well be called blurb or whatever, but if it's the channel that drives where the particle is rendered, and if it updates the way a position updates, that's what gives it the semantic of being a position channel. So there's no predefined meaning to things at all defined by the uh, by the controllers so when I talk about controllers the different things that can run on a particle and affect the particle we have we have three different types uh, the first one is initializers those are used to set the initial value of a channel when a particle is first spawned uh, we have simulators that run every frame and update the particle in various ways. For example, update the position by adding the velocity to it, as I talked about before. Uh, but they can also do things like spawning and, and um, killing particles uh, when that is necessary. Uh, so all kinds of updates are done by the simulators. And then we have visualizers, which are responsible for rendering particles uh, on the screen in, in various kinds of ways. Uh, so, let's look at what a particle system resource looks like. A particle system resource specifies for each cloud, as I said, there can be multiple clouds in, in, in a particle system. For each cloud, it specifies the channels um, that the cloud has and the controllers that operate on these channels. And the controllers typically are specified by a type. Uh, and, and this type is just a name uh, that maps to some C function that does the actual evaluation. So in the initializers here, we have a position square and that gets mapped on the C side into a function that randomizes a position in a sphere with this radius. Um, typically, it also specifies uh, the settings of also typically spe specifies the channels. Uh, that this controller will operate on. Um, we have some controllers where the channels are implicit. For example, this position sphere controller here, it is implicit that it con operates on a channel that is called position. Uh, this, this was kind of, this is kind of a design from when we started working on this system. 
I, I kind of think it's, it's bad to have that implicit dependency there. It would be better to, to, to just call the type of the controller uh, like random in sphere or something like that and then explicitly specify the channel that it should work on the position channel. And that way we, we truly have this situation where we have no predefined meaning in the channels. Because when we have uh, when we have the channel sort of implicit in this controller, we have kind of given it the meaning. And that might create problems. For example, we might want to create a, a particle that has two different positions, like position one and position two, and we might want them to be initialized to different things. So I think this is kind of a bad design that, that some controllers have predefined channels that, that sort of has lingered on. I think they should always be explicitly specified. So, so there are no predefined meanings. Uh, and the newer controllers, the ones we've added later, they always have explicit channels. Uh, and typically there are also some parameters that control what this, um, uh, what this controller does, like settings for the controller. So in this simple example here, uh, we have a lifetime, that's just how long this entire particle effect is going to live. Uh, and then we have a list of clouds, there's just one in this uh, particle effect. Uh, it has the capacity, which is the total number of, the maximum number of particles that can exist. Uh, so it will never go over this number and, and the buffers are precise to this number. Um, then some settings for, for rendering this. Uh, rendering settings. Then we define the channels. We have flow channels, age, life, size of the particles. And this controls how it reacts when it collides with physics. I'll talk more about that later. And some vector 3 channels, position, velocity, um, wind and collision. I'll talk more about that later. Then we have these initializers that give the particles their initial values. Um, Randomized position within a sphere. Uh, the channel uses this, oh, the size uses a random float uh, controller, which just produces a random uh, float value within this range and it gets assigned to this channel. Uh, this just initialize, initializes this channel with a static value. Same here, a static value. Life again gets a random. And this is the lifetime of the particle, how long it will exist. Again, gets a random float in this range. And these channels are just zero. Uh, that's all the initializers. And we have the simulators that run every frame on the particle. There's an H simulator that adds time, the delta time, to the H of the particle. Again, this one uses an implicit channel, so it will implicitly use the H channel. And there's an emitter. This will emit new particles. So at a certain rate, 100 particles per second, uh, it will emit uh, emit new par uh, new particles. Uh, this scale here is actually a curve that can can be used to scale this over time. But currently, it's just uh, it's just a flat line. Acceleration. Uh, this is adds gravity acceleration. So this implicitly used the uses the velocity channel. Again, not a good idea to implicitly use channels, but something we could refactor, I guess, if we, if we ever need to. But we're planning to do a major refactor of this system anyway, so not worth it. Yeah, and then there are additional, additional controllers like this, simulators, visualizers. There's only one visualizer here. It's uh, of a billboard type, so it will generate billboards. It, um, the billboards have position, color, and texture coordinates. And the sort of vertex writer setting here uh, specify how these controllers uh, get written. Size here gets uh, a value over lifetime, the size part of the, of the vector, uh, of the vertex. Um, the color has um, a fixed value also over lifetime and the position gets copied from the position in the simulation. Uh, so 
um, to dig this, to dig a bit more deep into this and look at the actual code. As I said, initializers initialize to the default value. And we have a bunch of them. Uh, we've seen some already. Zero, random float, velocity cones, produces a velocity inside a cone. Again, not a good idea to have the channel locked in here, but should be just a regular random a cone visualizer with the channel specified explicitly. Position in a sphere, position in a box, and a bunch of other things. And each of these initializers, let's find one here. Um, do we have random float, for instance? Each of these initializers has a compile function that parses the JSON data, stores it, stores it in a resource, and then it has an initializer callback that get, gets called when we need to initialize particles. And for all the particles that we created, it uh, fills this field, this channel, uh, with uh, the random value that we want. And we also, in the data that gets sent, sent to this initializer function, uh, we also have some other global data, like the position of the particle effect, the system time, and so on, if, if the initializer wants to make use of that. Um, simulators, this looks very similar. Uh, we have a bunch of predefined simulator types. Aging, integrating position, that means updating position from velocity, and so on and so on and so on. And they work just as the initializers. Uh, when you compile, they pull the data from the JSON file, drop it into a struct. And in this case, it just has references to the age channel and the, and the life channel. And on simulation, it gets a block with all the, uh, the with pointers to all the particles and also some global information like delta time that has passed and so on. And it then uh, gets the H and the life channels from this and for all particles it updates the updates the H with the delta time and if the H is greater than the particle's lifetime, how long the particle could live, the particle is, is killed. Uh, and then there are a bunch of lots and lots and lots of other similar uh, simulators for all the things that we want. Um, for visualization, we have three kinds of visualizers. Uh, billboard, which is the most common, draws billboard sprites uh, with position, size, and, and color tint using a specific material that is specified for the cloud. Uh, you can use a light visualizer uh, which means the particles will actually be lights, so they will exist in the in the render world as lights and, and light up other things. Uh, and you can also use full meshes. And then uh, we will feed a position and rotation and a scale from the particle simulation to the mesh. So so this can render out like real rocks or real 3D models. Of course, that's a bit more expensive than just rendering billboards. Um, creation and destruction of particles. Any simulator, any, any one of the simulators can, can emit or kill particles. Um, emitting is handled by an event stream. So in the, in the sort of argument, in the reference argument that the simulators get when they, when they are called, in addition to having references to the to the particle channels, uh, there is also a reference to an event stream there. And the event stream is, as all the other event streams we've talked about, it's just a, a big binary buffer where we just post uh, append the data for for events that happen. So simulators can add events to that stream for later processing. Uh, so if if a simulator wants to emit something it simply generates emit events uh, on this stream. And the emit event consists of a cloud index to begin with because, because uh, 
an emitter could emit a particle in a different cloud. It's still a part of the same uh, particle effect, but a different cloud in that effect. And that might be interesting. For example, you might have uh, one particle that gets uh, simulated and looks one way, and then as that particle is simulated, it might drop particles of another type. So that sort of falls down from this particle during that simulation. So in that case, you would, you would emit particles of a different type and to sort of fall down as this particle uh, traverses. Uh, so yeah, the emit event has like a type identifier to identify it as an emit event, and then it's just the index of the cloud and the position of the particle and the starting velocity that it should have when it is emitted. So these events get put on this event stream, and then at a later point when we've done all the simulation, we go through the event stream and process it, and we spawn new particles for each of these emit events. Um, killing is simpler. Uh, the simulator, if the simulator wants to kill a particle, it just swap erases uh, that particle with the last particle in the particle buffer and then decreases the, the particle count. And that's okay because we run the simulators in serial, we don't run them in parallel, so doing that won't disturb any other, any other simulator. Um, so one sort of important thing with the design of the particle system that, that, that affects it quite a lot, how it works, is that we run the particle simulation on the render thread. So not on, if you remember from the threading talk, we have a main thread that, that we do most of the simulation of, and then we have a render thread that does rendering. And with the particle system, uh, it's kind of different from all the other systems that we actually run the simulation on the render thread. So why do we do that? Well, particle systems tend to have a lot of state. I mean, the whole idea behind a particle system is to simulate a lot of things. So a particle system could be 100,000 particles. And then the state of that particle system is the position of all those 100,000 particles. So that uh, position is, uh, 12 bytes, so that's uh, 1.2 megabytes right there. And if you remember the design of our, our threading system, we have a design that requires any state change uh, as that occurs as part of the simulation to be reflected from the main thread to the render thread. So when the state changes in the main thread, uh, we post messages like this thing has moved, this thing is a new position, and those messages get eventually consumed by the render thread. If, if we would do that for particles, if we use the same approach for particles, that would become super expensive because we would then need to post, post the state change of all these 100,000 particles, which are typically all moving at the same time, which means that that's 1.2 megabyte of data that it would have to post, post to this buffer to be consumed later by the rendering thread. And that's just for the position. There might be color or another thing simulated too. Uh, so doing this for particles would, would be super expensive. So to avoid this, uh, we run the particle simulation on the render thread. And then, since that means that we already have all the data for the particles on the render thread and we don't need to copy it anywhere for rendering. We can just use it directly as it is from the, on the render thread. But this design decision to simulate on the render thread creates a lot of headache and it complicates things a lot. Uh, so one thing this means is that if Lua wants to stop a particle effect, we can't just stop the particle effect when, when we get the call from Lua. Because of course Lua runs on the main thread so that action uh, of stopping the particle effect needs to be synchronized with the render thread uh, where the simulation happens. So instead of just stopping the particle effect immediately, uh, we need to post an event. So Lua has to post an event that later gets consumed by the render thread and causes the uh, particle effect to be destroyed. So if we look at the particle world class, which, which implements the world of particles where all the all the particles live. Um, it has a bunch of packages. These are packages for posting messages to the render thread. So whenever 
So whenever this class gets called to do, oh, I guess it's later. Whenever this class gets called to do whatever, like destroying, destroying an effect, um, or creating a, creating an effect. Let's let's scroll down to something. Same. Blur. Yeah, destroying an effect, um, telling an effect to stop spawning, moving an effect, and so on. It all has to, it can't do the call immediately, it all has to be put into a package, and then that package get posted to the render stream and get processed by the render thread later. Uh, so all these things which would be very simple become, become kind of complicated to do. Uh, and especially resource management, becomes a bit tricky because we're we're used to the main thread being sort of driving in terms of of resources when they uh, when they get loaded and unloaded so uh, so making sure that the timing is right for loading and unloading is kind of tricky and in fact like over over the years uh, that we've had this system we've had a lot of thread bugs uh, caused by this uh, caused by this design by having the simulation happening on the render thread. Uh, hopefully they are all fixed by now. It was a long time ago, probably several years before since I saw a bug of that type in the system. Uh, so I think it's stable now and it works right now, but in retrospective, considering how much pain it was to, to do this, it might not have been the best solution. Maybe we should have used some other technique instead, double buffering the data. That makes sense on modern modern platforms where you have a lot of memory. On older platforms like PS3 where you're really memory constrained, double buffering isn't so attractive either. So yeah, but, but, but this design creates a lot of complexity and maybe, maybe not the best design. Um, so, wanted to say a little bit about particle collisions yeah I mean it's it's hard I mean I think any working solution is kind of a good solution so so I wouldn't I wouldn't tear this up just because because it's a working system right now but uh, I'm not sure if I if I design if I design it from scratch like a new I'm not sure I would do it uh, I'm not sure I would do it this way. I think, I, in fact, I would try to find some other way to do it because there is just so much confusing for having everything simulated on the main thread except for this thing. Uh, yeah, and more more confusion happens when it comes to particle collision, handling particle collision and wind effects uh, because, because that are uh, collision surfaces Collisions are, are physics objects that live in the world. And so, of course, they are simulated when the world is simulated on the main thread. And the same for wind effects. Wind effects and the simulation of wind effects also lives in the, in the main thread rather than the render thread. So in order for particles to, to interact with physics objects and with wind, we have to take special precaution. Uh, note that, note that uh, when I talk, talk about particle collision here, I mean actual physics collision. It's, it's popular these days to do screen space collision of particles. So, so in that case, all of the collision happens on the GPU and, and the CPU isn't even involved. Um, so it's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing actual collision with the physics world uh, that lives on the CPU in the main thread. So, as I said, particles can't directly query um, uh, the physics world or the wind system because these systems are not uh, not thread safe and they run on a separate thread. So, how does it work? How do how can we interact with this system? It's kind of complicated. So, what happens is that uh, look at um, physics, for instance. A simulator that wants to query the physics world can't do it directly. So what it will do instead is that it will it'll post an event to this event stream that I talked about earlier. 
uh, an event that says, I want to query physics. I want to do a ray cast from here to here and, and see what it hits. Uh, then we have a point in the particle simulation where we process this list of events and do spawn, uh, spawn of new particles, as I said before. Uh, this processing still happens on the render thread because particle simulation is on the render thread, so particle spawning is on the render thread. Uh, but we have another <laughs> event stream which is used to communicate from the render thread back up to the main thread uh, for the particle system. So uh, when we process these events on the render thread and see, oh, this is, event, this is an event that should go to the main thread, we take that event and post it to that other event stream that will eventually get consumed by the main thread. So it sort of trickles up uh, to the main thread. And this event stream, as other event streams, as the animation event streams, the physics event streams, get processed by the world update eventually. So when we update the world, we go through this event stream. And the world update, of course, happens on the main thread. Uh, so the world process events sees that, oh, this, um, this uh, particle system is requesting a ray cost. So the world will then actually perform the ray cost on the main thread. Uh, and then, of course, it has to feed that back to the particle system so it can react to it. But again, the particle system is on the render thread, so we can't just immediately, uh, immediately call it with that information. So instead, what we have to do is that we take the colli collision reply, sort of the information of what we hit and at what position we hit something, and we stuff that into a new event. And post that event to be processed by the render thread. And uh, so then when we're back in the render thread and the render thread processes events, the render thread will get to this event and see, oh, this is an event that comes from the, this is an event that is actually a reply from the main thread to the request that was previously sent by this simulator. And uh, then uh, it will, forward sort of that event, route it back to that simulator so that simulator can react to it. So that's a lot of overhead for doing something. If we, do, if we, if we simulate it on the main thread, this would just be a call, right? do rate cost process results. But because we're not, we have to go through all this convoluted loop. And of course, we have to handle all possible edge cases here. Since we have delays uh, here between when we post the events and when we later process the events, bad things can happen. So for example, the, the particle effect might die between, uh, between it has posted events and between the reply sort of gets back to it. So all of these things has, has to be taken into consideration and handled properly. And, and those are typically the, the places where, where you get these kinds of threading bugs and, and crashes that we, that we had a lot of before. Um, so particle collisions uh, use this mechanism. Um, the way it works is that the particles will, well, we have multiple collision system, but the most common one, uh, the particles will ray cast along their projected path and whatever they hit will be stored as a collision plane. So each particle, each particle will have one collision plane, which specifies where that particular particle uh, will collide. And if it doesn't end up in exactly that position, it doesn't, after like simulation, it might not follow the exact path. It doesn't matter because it still collides against the entire plane um, that we find with the rate cost. Uh, so, of course, if the, if the particle goes off course a bit, that plane, uh, plane might not be uh, up to date anymore because the particle would actually hit something else. So we then need to perform an additional rate cost in order to see, uh, well, with the way the particle is going now, what will it probably, probably hit? So there are settings in the particle effect for how often these rate costs should be performed. And that sort of, so you can sort of tune that to decide how much, how high a cost you want to pay for, uh, for doing these collision checks. And if you, if you don't do enough of them, uh, your particles will probably not find the right collisions and they will either fall to the ground or bounce against some imaginary thing. But maybe that is better than, than paying a really high cost for it. You can sort of, you sort of have to balance that uh, 
uh, yourself depending on how important accuracy is for this particular particle effect. Um, for wind effects, uh, we have one controller uh, simulator called Query Vector Field, which uh, talks to the vector field system and brings back information for it. So when that simulator runs, it will take all the, all the positions of all the particles in that cloud uh, that we want to simulate wind on. And it will create an event that says, I want to evaluate the vector field and I want to evaluate it at all these positions. So that might be quite a big uh, buffer, depending on how big the, the particle effect is. And just as with these other queries, this event bubbles up to the world where it's processed. The world will call, the, call into the vector field system that I've talked about before and say, can you evaluate the vector field, the wind at all these positions? It will get a reply, which is another buffer with the wind strength at all of these positions. And then it has to send that back to the particle system uh, with these uh, through the same event mechanism again. And these positions will then get stored in a, in a channel, in one of the channels of the particles. So typically particles that use this have a special vector three channel called wind that stores the wind strength uh, at the particle's position. And then it has another simulator called air resistance uh, because, because wind is just, wind, simulating wind is the same thing as simulating air resistance. It's just, a, just, you just offset the particle's velocity with the wind velocity and then it behaves exactly the same way. Uh, so that air resistance simulator will read the wind field and read the velocity field of the particle and then update the velocity field with, um, with any modifications caused by the air resistance. Um, in addition to these hard-coded controllers, we also have vector language controllers. So the vector language is the thing I talked about previously in the, in the math talk, uh, this sort of parallel bytecode where you can, you can write code to just do whatever and it will be evaluated as bytecode, but, but in parallel on a number of things at one time. So it runs quite efficiently for being bytecode. So you can write a controller in this language, which means you specify the input channels, the output channels, and, and your, uh, the vector language evaluator will be filled, uh, filled with that data, the data from those channels, will process that data and write it out. So, so this allows you to do completely custom controllers. So you're not locked to the sort of fixed set of controllers. You can hand write a completely new one. Um, but this system is not really super nicely integrated into the editors uh, right now. You kind of have to just hand write the code for doing this. Uh, just add a vector language controller and then you get the text field where you get to hand write this, uh, the code for doing this. So it's not the, it's not the, best, it's not the best system. Um, but that's something we want to change in the future. So. Uh, the future visions for the particle system. So there, there are drawbacks of the, uh, of the current system. First and foremost, we're limited by this fixed set of controllers, like the predefined set of controllers uh, specify what we can do with particles. And if we want to do something that doesn't match what these controllers already do, we're pretty much screwed. Well, we're not totally screwed because we can write our own vector language controller. But as I said, the interface for doing that is not really super nice right now. Uh, another problem is that it doesn't use SIMD to full efficiency. Um, it's pretty much yeah, up to each controller. Like a simulator can use SIMD in its, in its simulation code if it wants to, but it's not, it's not the default, it's up to the simulator to do that. And also the, the, the way we are store, storing thing is not the most efficient for SIMD. For example, we store the vector threes in, a, in just the buffer with vector three, vector three, vector three, which is not very useful for SIMD evaluation. You sort of have to unpack the vector three into, into a SIMD re register. It would be much better to just have 
a buffer with all the x positions, y positions, and z position. So, so to have the vector sort of splatted out, and then you could do more efficient SIMD, uh, SIMD evaluation. Um, another drawback is, another problem with this system is that currently GPUs are, are so programmable and powerful that it really makes sense to do a lot of the particle simulation on the GPU rather than on the CPU. And in this system, we don't really have any way of doing that. So that is definitely something that you that you would want to do. Also, our, our rendering system for particles is kind of limited. We have these billboards and mesh types and so on. But there are a lot of other stuff you, you could imagine doing with particles. As I said, particles don't have to be just billboards move, moving around. It could be anything where we have a large large number of things undergoing the same simulation. So things like footsteps and and whatever uh, whatever you can think of. And those things don't have to be rendered as simple billboards. They could feed into shader graphs in, in lots of interesting ways and control all kinds of parameters in those shader graphs. So so with a more flexible system you could really you could use this for for decals for for almost almost anything which would be interesting so the vision for the future is to sort of uh, get rid of these fixed uh, fixed controllers and instead create some kind of generic buffer processing system that just takes these blobs of data um, that we don't really care that much what they uh, represent. It's the same as with the current system. It could be the channels could be representing just whatever. We don't really care. So, but we take these uh, buffer buffers of data, these blobs of data, and then we have operators that operating that operate on them that are written in this our vector language or HLSL or some some kind of language like that for for bulk processing of data and. Such a sort of generic buffer processing system for just crunching on data with with um, with data driven functions could be used for a lot of other things too, and not necessarily just particles. It could be used for audio mixing, for instance, because audio mixing is just doing arithmetic operations on big buffers of data. So this same system could potentially have other uses too. And then we would want to control this system with a single graph that would be kind of similar to a shader graph, but it would also include uh, the particle simulation. So the graph would probably have CPU components and GPU components, and it would sort of define the flow of data, how it gets, sim what parts get simulated on the CPU, what part gets simulated on the GPU, how data flows from the CPU simulated buffers into GPU buffers, and and also connecting all that to a shader graph that in the end uh, renders out all this data in some interesting way. And so the simulation would run both on the CPU and on the CPU it would be fully SIMD and multi-threaded and another part of the of the evaluation would run on the GPU. So I think this could be, this is like a system we'd, we'd have in mind for years now but just not had the time to fully build it out but i think it would be something uh, something really cool to build and something really interesting so any questions on this mm, if not let's take a short break like two three minutes or so and then we'll continue with stories and ui okay 